three great presenters on tonight. My first presenter is going to be um, talking on set free in God's grace. The background scripture for that is coming from Romans chapter three, verses 23 and 24. Our presenter tonight is none other than a phenomenal, phenomenal woman. She is an author, she is a mother, she is a worship leader, she is a phenomenal woman. Um, it's none other than Dr. Nicole Jones. So Dr. Jones, we are in your hands. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I'm unmuted. I'm nervous <laughs> and all those things, but I do appreciate you um, thinking of me and reaching out to me. And for some reason, I feel like God just keeps setting me up for this stuff. So um, I'll comply <laughs> and do whatever God wants me to do. Um, so my name is Nicole Jones. I'll be speaking from the topic set free in God's grace. I'm going to try and move through it as quickly as I can. Y'all believe me. Um, and I would like, just like to take a few minutes to talk about the topic. And then when I'm done, I'm going to yield the microphone. <laughs> um, set free in God's grace. What does it mean to be set free in God's grace? The definition of set free means to be released from captivity or cleared from the obligation of slavery. In other words, it is to grant a person freedom from the duties he or she was obligated to perform while in captivity. So what is the grace of God again? Well, since the topic specifies God's grace, let me first identify the other form of grace, distinguish it from God's grace, then define the grace of God. Jeremiah chapter 34 and 11 illustrates an example of the other form of grace. After King Zedekiah made a proclamation with all the people in Jerusalem that everyone should free their Hebrew slaves and no male nor female Hebrew should be held in bondage, all the officials and old people who entered into this covenant agreed and set the slaves free. But afterward, they changed their minds and took back the slaves they had freed and enslaved them again. This passage in Jeremiah demonstrates an example of the other form of grace referred to as man's grace. As demonstrated in the text, man's grace is an extension of forgiveness out of obligation or out of protocol. It releases the oppressed of the wrong they've done up front, but then captures them and holds the same wrong against them the moment the opportunity is presented again. Man's grace releases their oppressed, but then keeps an eye on every step they make. So the people who've been released are never truly free as they proceed. However, God's grace is different. In St. John chapter eight, verse 36, Jesus said, if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. In other words, when God declares us as free and forgiven, he means it. God's grace is an attribute of God. It only displays godly attributes. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, a God spoke to the prophet saying, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. In this verse, we find that grace is a spirit and with God's grace came the ability to understand one another's pain. As described in Acts 20 and 32, Romans 5, 20 and 21, Ephesians 1 and 7, and Ephesians 2 and 7, God's grace edifies, it builds up, it redeems, it reconciles, it is humble, it is forgiving and full of good understanding. God's grace come in abundance of godly attributes and is freely extended towards those who seek it. Now that we've distinguished the grace of God from man's grace, let's clearly define the grace of God. 
throughout the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, we find certain people asking the, to find grace in God's sight. Have you ever wondered what that meant? Like, what do you mean May I find, if I find grace in your sight? In Genesis 19, 18 through 20, Lot asked an angel of the Lord for grace to escape to a nearby city rather than to mountains as initially instructed. In, in, in Exodus 33 and 13, Moses requested of God, if I have found grace, show me your way that I may know thee. In, Ju in Judges 6 and 17, Gideon asked God, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me a sign that you talk to me. As illustrated in the verses above, God's grace is the permissiveness of God. It is the consent to do, to perform, or to go as God sees fit. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 reads, says, a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. The grace of God is the bestowal of freedom upon each of us to do God's will. It is the only reason we're able to walk before God and to dwell in his presence. My topic scripture, Romans 23 and 24 reads, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, we hear that scripture often, but what does it mean? In other words, it's saying we all have a mark of sin on our record that disqualifies us from experiencing the superiority, the preeminence, and the greatness of the royal, true, and living God. The mark of sin made us blemished ruins. It made us marked outsiders, exiles, and rejects. However, with, without the grace of God, not one of us would be deemed fit to even access the premises of God. Nonetheless, without our worthiness, the grace of God grants us permission to enter into the presence of God and feel him, hear him, and even whisper our prayers to him. This undeserving grace of God is the place where our God-given freedom resides. Our salvation and deliverance are only found in the grace of God. Now, since we know that our freedom and our deliverance are only found in God's grace, tonight I want to quickly discuss what the grace of God sets us free from, how we are set free, and how do we stay free in God's grace. First, what does the grace of God set us free from? We all, we're saved, we're believers, so what could the grace of God possibly, possibly set us free from? The grace of God delivers us from the entrapments of pits, yokes of bondages, and snares set by the enemy. We should never be deceived, even as Christians, we should never be deceived into believing our daily walk with Christ is free of traps. Ephesians 5 and 15 says, see that ye walk not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Despite our progress in Christ, I need to slow it down. Despite our progress in Christ, at no point throughout our Christian walk should we ever become complacent with the relief of our first deliverance. Just as predators with their prey, our enemy sets spiritual pitfalls, yokes of bondages, and snares every day to destroy us or to interfere with our relationship with God. Let's walk through it a little bit. Spiritual, spiritual pitfalls. First, spiritual pitfalls. What are pitfalls? Pits are pitfalls or hidden, camouflaged poles set by hunters to capture and hold its prey in place. They are often narrow and set for animals of all sizes, making it difficult for, for them to move once they've fallen in. Just like natural prey, just like natural pits, spiritual pits are also camouflaged holes 
set by the adversary to capture and hold us in place. Both saints and sinners experience spiritual pits. Let's, let's give some examples. As in the story of Joseph in Genesis 37, 20 through 24, our families can place us in pits. Due to no fault of our own, their decisions can have us suffering and struggling through years of difficulty because of choices they chose to make. <laughs> Sometimes our comfort zones, thank you, Sister Monique, I need that encouragement. Sometimes our comfort zones are pits. <laughs> Much like the children of Israel in 1 Samuel 13 and 6 who ran away from the Philistines in fear and hid themselves, they hid themselves in pits. Sometimes we run into pits out of fear and for the sake of comfort. God could be trying to expand us into something different, into different areas of our lives, but we stay in the same narrow and restricted place much of our lives out of convenience. And, and finally, <laughs> sometimes people themselves are pits. People pits, I call them. People pits are people we're drawn to through the disguises of pleasure. However, they become a great headache for us later and bring into our lives an abundance of despair and regret. Proverbs 23 and 27 says, a strange woman is a narrow pit. Sometimes people we entertain and engage could be a gateway to hell. So regardless of who we are, <laughs> we must be mindful of our associations and avoid those pits. I gotta keep moving. Yokes of bondage, another entrapment. The grace of God sets us free from are the yokes of bondage. We may not be on the corner, but we're doing some of these spiritual things and yokes or bondage are much different from pits. I gotta slow down up in here, okay. Yokes are not camouflage. They are not hidden. These are not yokes. No, nope, yokes are not hidden. Animals are not lured into yokes. Yokes are intentional. A natural yoke is a wooden beam that is placed around the neck of one or two oxen or animals to pull a load for its handler. A farmer can rely on the weight of one yoked ox to pull down a large tree. It can rely on the strength of two yoked oxen to transport heavy loads such as logs and machinery. However, despite the oxen willingness, in no instance are yokes attached right away. The control is gradual. <laughs> An animal is first lightly roped and slowly trained every day while being walked and fed and given good tasty treats. However, while it's in the care of this handler, it, 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 however, while it's, being, while it's in the care of its handler, it is being evaluated to determine if it, can, if it can or cannot be trained. If it cannot be trained, it cannot be used. If it cannot get comfortable, it cannot be used. If it becomes afraid or frightened or senses danger, it could be harmful or fatal for the trainer and cannot be used. So the process towards the yoke is gradual. Ooh, hallelujah. Only after an animal has become comfortable with its surroundings and deemed as trainable is a yoke applied. Come on now. All right, an oxen can weigh over a thousand pounds. It can weigh over a thousand pounds, possibly 2000 pounds and have the ability to trample its handler, yet it stays in place and let the handler put yokes on them, control them and do their heavy work. Much like natural yokes, the process towards the yoke of bondage is also gradual. It is applied after we become comfortable with our surroundings. Galatians 5 and 1 says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Ooh, hallelujah. After God has delivered us, 
we should not find ourselves choosing to carry out Satan's dirty work. Come on now. Unrighteousness is never the natural thing to do. It is always the thing we are tempted to do. Righteousness is not natural and normal. It's what we're tempted to do. Rudeness, meanness, and unkindness are pat rudeness, meanness, and unkindness are not patterns of God. If we see it in a church, if we see it, excuse me, even in the church, we should know that that is not our example. The moment we get comfortable, the moment we get comfortable with hearing people speak against one another, ridicule one another, be nasty towards one another, then we're being trained to the yoke of bondage. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Loved it. Lord, help me. Thank you for your word. Yokes of bondage are designed for people who have weight, who can pull weight. Those whose actions have the potential to do some great damage in their homes, churches, workplaces, and ultimately the body of Christ. If God says, love your enemies, then hatred is evidence of captivity. If he says, be kindly affectionate one to another, then meanness is evidence of captivity. And even if we witness it, we must be careful to never yield to it. All right, snares, we're moving. Lastly, the grace of God delivers us from snares. And I found myself in snares a lot. These snares are traps that are set for prayer that are moving forward. They are nooses. We know what nooses are. Nooses are made up of wires. You know, um, African-Americans were on noose, placed on nooses at one point. Nooses are made up of wires and are attached to a stationary object such as a log or a tree. Thinner, lower snares are set for smaller animals and thicker, higher position snares are placed for, high, for larger animals. As the animals walk towards about their business, this is it. As the animals walk about full, as the animals walk forward about their business, their heads or bodies become stuck in the snare, capturing or sometimes killing them right away. Other times, animals walk into snares, but the wires break from the stationary object as they move forward, but the snare is still around their bodies without them even realizing it immediately. But each time they walk, the snare pulls tighter and tighter, causing pain, suffocation, irritation, or even death. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm about to compare this to something. Snares can even affect, snares can affect any animal. Even animals as gigantic as elephants have walked into a snare that was set for a much smaller, a much smaller animal. Nevertheless, Whatever the, wherever the snare caught them, caused them much pain, irritation or in that area. Here we go. Like natural snares, spiritual snares come to kill us or bring irritation in our lives as we move forward and to attempt to make progress. These are only for the people who are trying to move forward. When God gives us wisdom and strategy on the path to move forward, even a slight deviation from his path lead to a snare. Snares are not yokes. We are not causing damage to others. With snares, we're causing the damage. The damage that's being caused is being done to ourselves. We are bringing harm to our own situation. When we're convinced to sometimes, when we're convinced to spend just a little bit too much money, then we have to suffer for it afterward. That could be a snare. When we agree to do things we know we don't have the time or energy to do, but we sign up to do it anyway, that could be a snare. When we look at uh, when we look at what others are doing and move ahead of God trying to do the same thing, it could be a snare. Snare comes to distract us, irritate us, and cause us to lose focus on the blessings of God in our, our lives. We miss out on great opportunities. God has destined for us because we are perplexed with problems that may or may not have been intended for us. David wrote in Psalm 124 and 8, our soul has escaped a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Whichever trap we find ourselves stuck in, the grace of God can deliver us 
from out of it. The grace of God, how are we set free? How? So we know the, the, the traps that are set, but how do we become free from these traps? How do we become free from these pits, yokes of bondages and bondage and snares? The grace of God sets us free through God's command or at God's command or instructions. Through God's word or we set free. Romans 1 16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. Only at God's word or command does the grace of God frees us. Nonetheless, God is tactical. So he, the way he frees us, he frees us in different ways. Depending on the trap we're in depends on the approach God may use to send freedom to us. Sometimes we, he will, God will use his people to speak deliverance into our lives. Isaiah 61 and one says, the, Lord, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to pro proclaim, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisoners prisons to that to that those that are brown sometimes deliverance is spoken into our lives for instance in saint john chapter 8 verse 11 in the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery when jesus said go and sin no more he spoke deliverance into her life though he didn't lay his hand on her he freed her from right where he sat another way we are freed is through god's hand Sometimes God's hand will pull us out of ruts and traps. David in Psalm 41 through two said, declared, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of an horrible pit and out of a miry clay and set my feet up on a rock and established my going. We don't know the exact pit David found himself in, but we do know that it was the hand of God that brought him out of it and brought him to a safe place. Finally, sometimes God dispatches an angel to set us free. In Acts 16, 25 and 26, Paul and Silas were locked in jail and at the sound of their prayer and praise, God sent an earthquake to deliver them from their physical chains and physical situations. Their very words, the very words that we speak can initiate deliverance in our lives. We can go through challenges if we, when we can go through challenges, I gotta slow down, y'all. When we can go through challenges without complaining, without finding fault, without speaking negatively, if we can go through our situations glorifying God, then our very words can petition God to hear our case and God can send an earthquake to not move against us, but move for us. Hallelujah, like he did for Paul and Silas. Finally, how do we stay free? How do we stay free? This is important. All of it's important, but this is part important too. Finally, how do we stay free? We stay free in God's grace through prayer and divine guidance and instructions. The key component in every trap the enemy sets is obliviousness. We aren't familiar, we're, we're often unfamiliar with the dangers of them. When given his model of prayer, Jesus instructed his disciples to in Matthew 6, 6 and 13, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We hear this often, but do we know what it means? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Meaning we don't always see the traps the enemy sets. We don't always see the little small tasks that will frustrate us and have us flustered the whole day. We don't know every conversation that'll have a, that'll get us emotional and lead to disputes or confusion. We don't always see the encounter that comes to wound our confidence or paralyze our progress with shame. But God sees the results behind every step and decision we make. He knows the pitfalls, yokes and snares attached to even the innocent looking things we do. So in asking God for direction and guidance in our everyday, in our everyday lives before moving forward or making a decision, then following God's guidance, we remain free in his grace. We remain free in God's grace by never taking the grace of God for granted. If God is showing us a trap, 
if he is showing us the error of our ways or what's ahead, we should not justify our actions or defend our misdeeds. We should not deliberately pursue that path and carelessly fall into the traps that the enemy that the enemy set believing God will simply deliver us. Some decisions we can make can cause us to fall short of the blessings of God that were assigned to us that we'll never experience. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 and 16, Paul admonishes us not to fail of the grace of God like Esau, who sold his birthright for a morsel meal and found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. Esau was assigned a birthright, but because he sold it based on how he felt in the moment, he, he missed out on it, and the grace of God did not permit, did not permit, did not permit him to ever experience it again. We don't ever want to risk the grace of God never working for us or speaking on our behalf. When we walk, walk humbly before the Lord, and don't take his grace for granted, we remain free in his grace. Lastly, we remain free in God's grace by asking for the spirit of God and walking in it. As I mentioned earlier in Zechariah 12 and 10, there's a spirit of grace. God's grace only displays godly attributes. It edifies, it builds up, it redeems, it reconciles, it's humble, it's forgiving, it's poised, it's composed, it's kind, is disciplined and full of understanding. Jesus Christ himself in, in Luke chapter 20 verse, chap, Luke chapter two, verse 40 was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. He walked in the spirit of grace. And if we are to remain free in God's grace, we should ask God to, spool, to pour the spirit of his grace upon us. In conclusion, there's an end to this y'all. <laughs> In conclusion, the grace of God is the permissiveness of God. The grace of God is the bestowal of freedom upon each of us to do God's will. The grace of God is where the salvation and a deliverance of the Lord resides. We all have a mark of sin on our record that disqualifies us from experiencing a holy, true, and living God. But the grace of God permits each of us to walk before them. God's grace set us free from the spiritual bondages of pits, yokes, and snares that were placed by the enemy. The grace of God sets us free through God's word. God can use people to speak or proclaim deliverance that we need into our lives. He can deliver us through his outstretched hand, or he can dispatch one of his angels to set us free. Nonetheless, we don't have to stay bound. Even now, if we are stuck in a pit, even now, if we are stuck in a yoke, even now, if we are stuck in a snare, the grace of God is doing the work right now to set us free. Just that instantaneously, the, the grace of God is here doing the work to set us free. And now that we are free, let us stay free in God's grace. Never let us, let us never, let us sidestep the grace of God through, through self-confidence and self-assurance. Let us always consult God in prayer. Let us ask him to guide our steps and lead us around the spiritual traps and pitfalls set by the enemy. Let us never find ourselves taking the grace of God for granted and assuming that it will always be there to set us free. If God is showing us our wrong path in erroneous ways, let us quickly correct them rather than justify them or defend them. And finally, let us remember to ask God for the spirit of grace then walk in it. In doing these things, we will steer clear of the pits, yokes of bondage, and snares set by the enemy and remain sex free in God's grace. Pray much for me. <laughs>
Thank you for tuning in to our worship service here at Praise Center Church of God in Christ. We pray that something was said or done that encouraged you, that empowered you, that strengthened you on this day. Now it is time for us to give you an opportunity to sow into the life of ministry here at Praise Center Church of God in Christ. And there are multiple ways that you can give. First, you can give via Cash App by giving to Dollar Praise Center VA. You also can visit our website, praisecenterkojic.org. Click on the giving link, and it will allow you to give via our website. You also can go to PayPal for those that like to use PayPal and send your donation to info at praisecenterkojic.org. And then last but not least, you can give via Givelify by searching for Praise Center Church of God in Christ in Dumfries, Virginia. Make sure you see my face or Lady Yo's face on the image and you will be giving or donating to the right location. We pray again that you were blessed by our service and we want to let you know by you seeding into the life of Praise Center Church of God in Christ, we're going to declare blessings be upon you. God says, when we give, it shall be given unto us good measures, pressed down, shaken together and running over. We speak blessings to be in your life as you have sown into good soil here at Praise Center Church. May God bless you and may heaven shine upon you all. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.